nice intimate group. So Christine's going to be able to talk to you about the invasive plants and then she's got a hands-on thing. So if anybody doesn't know, I'm Linda Shire with the Acton Wakefield Watersheds Alliance and we are partnering with the Acton Public Library and the Gaffney Library on this series of what we're calling Water Talks. And this is our second one of the year. First one was in Wakefield. We're alternating between Wakefield and Acton. First one was um, a reprise of the eel, our most fascinating fish, last month with um, Allison Eberhardt from uh, UNHC Grant. And today we have Christine Gorek, is that how you pronounce it, uh, from the Lake Stewards of Maine, formerly the Volunteer Lake Monitoring Program. <laughs> Um, and she's going to just give an overview of aquatic invasive species and you know what we can expect to see around here and what impacts they have. And then she's brought some um, samples to show you how to identify a plant and go through that. So um, with no further ado, Christine, take it away. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. And um, so I'm just going to cover something a little bit about invasive aquatic plants here in Maine um, and although my focus is Maine this is it's the same information uh, for New Hampshire as well they have a little bit of a different program but um, basically the same all the same information so welcome uh, let me tell you a little bit about my organization the Lake Stewards of Maine formerly the volunteer lake monitoring program so we as an organization um, as a group have been uh, keeping a watchful eye on the health of Maine lakes since 1971 back when we were part of um, the Maine DEP we were a program formed by the DEP, we later became a nonprofit um, organization. Our mission has been uh, to protect Maine lakes through widespread uh, citizen participation in gathering and disseminating credible scientific information pertaining to lake health. Um, we are uh, the oldest and one of the largest statewide citizen lake monitoring programs in the United States. We train and provide technical support for thousands of volunteer citizens, scientists all over the state. Uh, we have about 1,300 certified citizen lake scientists monitoring roughly 450 lakes. Um, although we do have a lot more people who are trained, who are out there, um, uh, who aren't necessarily certified. And we are the largest collector of scientific information pertaining to Maine lakes. Maine has an Invasive Aquatic Species Action Plan and it has three basic uh, tenants here. Prevention, keeping the plants and the um, other invasive species out. Early detection and rapid response and management for if they do get here. Uh, early detection is largely what I'll be discussing today and that is largely what our invasive plant patrol program covers, although we do support every aspect of the IAS action plan. Uh, so first, let's talk a little bit about what are invasive aquatic plants. And possibly the best way to describe them is by telling you what they're not. They are not native aquatic plants. Maine's native plants, and, and all native plants, provide um, some, some unique and special uh, protections for our lakes. So they protect water quality, they provide habitat for wildlife, uh, they provide food for wildlife, and enhance biological diversity. And one of the most important things that they do is they occupy those areas of the lake that would otherwise be open and available for infestation by these invasive plants. Invaders, on the other hand, are very detrimental to our lakes and they have some advantages over our native plants. And one of those is that they're very well adapted. They're good at growing, they're good at getting what they need. They're strong competitors, able to outcompete other plants for uh, resources. But possibly the thing that makes them stand out the most is that they're from away. Um, and because of that, because they're not native to here, any checks and balances that kept them from growing out of control have been left behind. 
it's important to note that invasiveness works both ways. So here we have, um, for example, Eurasian water milfoil, highly invasive, very problematic. In its native range, it's a native plant, no problem. Um, in its native range, which is Eurasia, um, they're actually having a problem with what they call American water weed as an invasive plant. Of course, here we just call it common water weed. It's, it's a native plant. Over there, it's highly invasive. So that invasiveness works both ways. When we take a plant out of its native area and move it somewhere else, it can become invasive. So there are 11 invaders, aquatic in plants on the uh, Maine's watch list. Uh, we currently have found six of those to be in Maine. Uh, so Eurasian water milfoil, hydrilla, European naiad, curly leaf pondweed, variable water milfoil, and most recently, European frog bit. Um, European frog bit was first found last year on Cavasaconte Lake, um, and it, uh, Cavasi is a very large lake, and it did a full survey for the first time last year and found uh, both the frog bit, the, the um, European frog bit, as well as a, um, an infestation of uh, Eurasian water milfoil. And more Eurasian water milfoil was also found in Grandin Pond, which is a small quarry pond in, I believe, Scarborough. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about the plants that are currently here in the state. First, we have variable water milfoil. It's the most abundant invader in the state. Um, I have some maps for you that have that show that last map that I showed you um, that show you the locations of the infestations if you're interested uh, in seeing where those are. Most lakes in Maine that have an infestation are infested with variable water milfoil and that includes a hybrid of variable water milfoil um, that is in just a few ponds uh, in Maine. The next is hydrilla. Hydrilla is considered to be the worst of the worst invaders. It grows uh, deeper than any other plant. It grows in higher salinity than any other plant. It is a very bad plant. Um, it's currently known to be in three ponds or water bodies in the state. Uh, the first place where it was found was Pickerel Pond, uh, it, right here in York County, um, and then later was found in Damascotta Lake and Davis Stream um, up in Lincoln County. Eurasian water milfoil, currently found in uh, two ponds, oh, uh, I forgot, I'm sorry, it's three ponds, Grandin Pond should also be on here. Um, but Pleasant Hill Pond in Scarborough was where this picture was taken. Uh, those golf balls are actually floating golf balls. <laughs> However, uh, there has been stories about the um, Eurasian water milfoil growing so densely that mice can scurry across the top of the, the infestations. So, and then later also, um, last year, it was found in Cabasaconte Lake. I do want to note that it was, at one point, also in Salmon Lake in the Belgrades and was delisted in 2014. They found it early, they attacked the problem um, very, very heavily, they went after it, and they were able to completely remove the plant. Um, eradication is very difficult. If you can find an infestation early, then eradication becomes much more possible. Curly leaf pondweed, currently found in three ponds in the state of Maine. West Pond in Parsons Field is the first place where it popped up. It's been there for quite some time. Uh, Legion Pond in Kittery, and then more recently a small uh, private pond in Camden, Maine. European Naiad was found first in Legion Pond, um, and then Again, uh, found more recently in Northeast Pond and Spalding Pond, right here in, uh, in York County. Um, and then finally, the European frog bit was found in Cobb-Sicanti Lake um, in Kennebec. I do want to point out, in the state of Maine, it's, it is the rule that a, a lake that is infested has a single invader. Obviously, some of these lakes have more than one invader. 
um, and that's kind of out of the normal for us. However, in most other states, a lake that is infested is infested with two, three, four, five invasive plants, um, and so that just kind of increases the difficulty of dealing with them. We do have other invaders on our radar that are not necessarily um, aquatic plants, but that we do think you should keep an eye out for. Uh, so some invasive fauna that you might want to um, keep an eye out for, and these are known to occur in the state. Northern pike is um, an invasive fish, and invasive fish don't always follow the same pattern as um, other invasive species. Most invasive species get where they're going accidentally. People don't realize that they're moving them. However, with fish, often fish are purposefully transported to new water bodies by people who are interested in fishing that fish but aren't necessarily interested in traveling to where it is. Um, so while northern pike does move around accidentally in people's bait buckets when they don't know that it's in there, um, it can and is moved often um, by people actively. Um, another uh, invasive animal that we know is here in the state is rusty crayfish. Uh, it looks a lot like our native crayfish, um, but it, uh, it has some benefits um, and can outcompete our native crayfish. There is a crayfish study that's being headed by Karen Wilson at the University of Southern Maine. We are helping with that, and if that's something that you're interested in, please let me know. Um, other invasive fauna also known to occur in the state is Chinese mystery snail. Chinese mystery snails are large. If you find a snail uh, that is larger than a walnut, you have a Chinese mystery snail. Our native snails are very small. Um, and we are tracking uh, incidents of Chinese mystery snail. We have a map on our um, Lakes of Maine website. So if you find one and you're not sure if that lake has a known infestation, please let us know. Um, there are also people who are actively uh, attacking this problem. They are going out, they are doing um, Chinese mystery snail uh, harvests. <laughs> they go diving, they drag them out um, and throw them into the woods. Apparently raccoons are very fond of eating them. <laughs> um, so if you have questions about Chinese mystery snails um, and how to deal with them, please let us know. Christine, I have a question. Sure. So they're all over Brady's Lake and um, there's always been a question of how do they alter the ecosystem? Do we know what they... There hasn't been a lot of research into what it is that they're doing. Um, we do know that they're much larger than our native snails um, and they do um, they are having an effect, but no one has really done the studies to say what it is that they're doing. Um, the most noticeable thing, I think, um, and obviously there's no scientific backup for this, but in a lake that has a large amount of Chinese mystery snails, often you can smell it. <laughs> Um, when they die, they, they, I mean, they, they don't smell good at the best of times, but especially when they die, they smell atrocious, um, which I have found out firsthand trying to pick up a shell that had one in it. Mm -hmm. And the smell just doesn't come off your hands for days. Um, <laughs> it's, it's bad. Um, so, but I, that's the one thing that I've noticed. A lot of times I can smell when there are mystery snails, lo a lot of mystery snails in a lake, just by the smell. So, um, but we are, we are hopeful that someone will do some more research into what exact effects they're having on other snail populations, on, you know, plant populations, on detritus and, and the ecosystem. Um, as far as I know, there haven't been those studies yet. So, um, uh, other invasive fauna that we'd like you to keep an eye out that's not known to occur here in Maine, but is very close to us. Um, so zebra and quagga mussels, has everyone here heard about zebra mussels? No? Okay, so um, zebra mussels are very small, the size of your fingernail, your pinky fingernail, um, but they grow 
and reproduce a lot. They um, can just cover themselves any hard surface they can grow on. Fog mussels will grow basically as a carpet on any soft surface and they just push everything out. Um, zebra mussels have caused problems in lakes where they are growing profusely um, that are used as water sources. They actually clog intake pipes and have to be scraped off regularly to keep the water flow going. Um, they uh, are, uh, they can really cause a lot of problems and they're so small that finding them if you're inspecting your boat to try and see if you're carrying them um, is, is difficult and also in their, um, in their infant stage they are uh, invisible to the naked eye so they could just be in ballast water. Um, and that's actually how they are thought to have originally shown up in America is in, uh, they showed up first in the Great Lakes and, and we believe that they came over in ballast water from somewhere else. Um, and I, I wanna say that this is something that's on our doorstep. We actually had a plant, an invasive plant, that came in for identification to our offices last year. And when we were looking at it, we noticed, actually, uh, my um, coworker took pictures. She sent them off to a group that, um, that makes sure that identifications, we, we kind of check with a bunch of experts when, when we think we've got something, um, but we want to make sure everyone else thinks so too. There was a consensus. It was uh, Eurasian water milfoil that had been collected during a courtesy boat inspection. Um, but someone noticed in one of the pictures something clinging to the stem and it was a zebra mussel. So, so that, was, that was quite the find. Um, other, other invaders, Asian clam, again, grows like a carpet on, on the uh, sandy bottoms and just pushes everything else out. Uh, Chinese mitten crabs, um, and the spiny water flea. The spiny water flea is currently in the Great Lakes. It's a micro crustacean. Uh, it causes a lot of problems. That spine that you see growing off the back of it uh, makes it indigestible and it outcompetes everything in its size range. Uh, so fish have nothing else to eat, but they can't digest these spines. Uh, so the fish eat these uh, spiny water fleas and then, then they essentially starve. Um, so it's a big problem and again you can see the, that's their tails coming off of that um, fishing line right there, just spiny water fleas all over it. Um, so things that we are keeping an eye out uh, and would like you to keep an eye out for. Uh, there's also invasive flora that is not uh, true aquatic but these are wetland plants um, not known yet. Uh, these ones are, are currently in the state. Uh, purple loosestrife, I'm sure everyone's seen purple loosestrife. Um, and that's a wetland plant. It, uh, we watched it travel up the I-95 corridor. It likes road ditches. Uh, common reed, um, which some of you may have seen around, is doing a similar uh, thing. Um, so it's something that we're keeping an eye on and there are uh, people who go out and do removal projects uh, for both of those. Um, and then glossostigma is a aquatic plant. It's not known to be here. We are concerned about it because it grows like a carpet. Uh, it's only a few centimeters tall. It looks like two little green bunny ears, um, but it grows so thickly that it just pushes all the competition out. And uh, not to leave anything, any stone unturned, we also have invasive algae. <laughs> This is uh, the starry stonewort. It looks like a higher plant. It's actually a colonial algae. We have native starworts in the state. Uh, starry stonewort, however, um, is much, uh, it's a much faster grower and it produces these little star-shaped reproductive structures by the hundreds. Um, so that is uh, something that we're keeping an eye out for and also Didymo. Didymo is not known to be in here but it is right over the border in New Hampshire. Uh, Didymo is also known as rock snot. It's a little, it's because it's it, of the way it looks, it's not actually because of how it feels. <laughs> Um, and um, if you ever touch it, you'll know um, what I mean because it doesn't feel snotty, it feels like wet felt. And that's formed by um, 
the, the cells, the diatom cells, um, leave behind these stalks that they use to attach themselves to the rocks, and that is what's creating um, what that gentleman is holding in his hands. That river is in New Zealand, and it is just didymo from, from side to side. Um, so, let's go back to plants and talk a little bit about the impacts that these plants can have. First, invasive aquatic plants can grow and spread rapidly. All it takes is a seed or a fragment and you can have a new infestation. This is illustrated really well by the spread of zebra mussels in the United States. So this map is um, the extent of zebra mussel infestation known about in 1988. You can see it's in the Great Lakes and that's pretty much it. By 1993, it spread throughout the Great Lakes, the upper Ohio River Valley, the Mississippi, um, 2005, it has continued moving out. Um, and on this particular map, anywhere where you see a star is a place where a zebra mussel was found on a boat or trailer or tackle about to launch into another lake. So you can see it's spreading throughout the, the country there. This is the most recent map um, from the United States Geological Survey. Um, or is it the USDA? Anyways, from the government. <laughs> um, and this is the 2018 map of known zebra mussel infestations. You can see it's up in the St. Lawrence Seaway. Um, it appears to be all through the, um, the region of the Great Lakes and the Mississippi River. It's, it's, made, it to the, it's made it to California. <laughs> Um, and uh, it just, they keep on spreading and plants do the same thing. With plants, you have to be, um, you have to be growing where you can get the things that you need to grow. Plants require sunlight to grow and so only parts of a lake are open to them. This is a map of Great Pond uh, up in the Belgrades and they did a study. All the areas where the lake is less than 15 feet deep, which is a rough estimate of how deep most plants can grow. Um, everything that is less than 15 feet deep is shaded in yellow. So about one third to one half of this lake is available or possible uh, that an infestation could grow. And in fact, um, the lake does have an infestation um, of variable water milfoil that was discovered some years back up in the um, Great Meadow Stream up here in that basin, which you can see is completely in the yellow. So uh, there are pretty destructive impacts on the ecosystems, uh, the aquatic ecosystems from these plants. Uh, this particular picture is from Florida and that is a infestation that's not a field that is all water under there um, so there's the destruction of fish habitat in the early stages of an infestation sometimes fish can grow quite large because there's more grounds hunting grounds and more places for them to hide from predators however as the infestation grows there becomes less area and fish size actually decreases because there's not enough room for them. Um, it contributes to water quality decline and there's obviously a severe impact to biodiversity because this is the only plant that is growing here. Um, they're also a primary cause of freshwater species extinctions. There are economic impacts that are associated with these plants and studies have shown us again and again that invasive plant infestations are negatively impacting the economic activity that we associate with lakes. So first, it depresses tourism and recreational activity because this is not a lot of fun to boat or swim through and so um, people who have the option may not come to a lake that has an infestation. Uh, there's also been studies uh, about how much um, economic drive visitors to Maine Lakes bring in total. Um, so the study was done in 1997 and then updated in 2005. Obviously, those numbers are a little bit old, but they still 
um, illustrate pretty importantly that visitors to Main Lake spend 2.3 billion annually and that causes 3.5 billion in economic activity, 1.8 billion in annual income and 50,000 jobs just associated with Main Lakes. Uh, an infestation can depress your property values, which impacts the tax base. And we've seen any time that a lake um, has an ongoing infestation, it often affects um, what the tax rate, what the, what the houses around that lake are worth. Their taxes drop because are, the houses are no longer worth what they were, and so everyone else's taxes have to rise to make up that difference. Um, there are also costs that are associated with control. We assume that if you have an infestation, you're going to want to do something about it, um, but there are costs associated with that as well. Um, so, and infestations can result in some complex social issues. <laughs> and if you have uh, a town meeting about this, you probably have as many opinions as there are people um, at the town meeting. Do we quarantine the lake that is infested? Do we quarantine the lake that is not infested and keep it from becoming infested? Um, so these questions are difficult to deal with and, uh, and really get, get people going. Um, also, if you have an infestation, your funding challenge, where's the money come from this year? Where does it come from next year? How do you sustain that, um, sustain that funding because these infestations often require long-term um, control. It, if you eradicate, that's great, but often it is a long-term just, you know, keeping control of the situation. Uh, there are health impacts. 50% of people in Maine get their drinking water from a surface source, and so water quality decline from these infestations can cause problems for your local water district. Uh, again, the issues with access, whether or not we should be quarantining water bodies that are infested or protect water bodies which are uninfested. Um, in Maine, we have a long history of public access to our waters, uh, and so any talk of quarantine obviously is going to be a very fraught issue. Uh, so let's talk about how these invaders spread because all it takes is one seed or a tiny fragment. Some plants only need two to three centimeters to grow a whole new plant. Um, and so they move around in a couple of ways. One way is by wildlife vectors. They can, uh, they can be picked up on a moose's antler, taken from one lake to another, or, or birds. Uh, a lot of the seeds can go right through a duck and come out the other side and be fine. <laughs> Um, but we are by far the primary vector of how these plants move around. You can see uh, that picture of uh, plants hanging off of that um, boat trailer and that boat motor. We're definitely the ones who are doing most of the moving. There are not just um, boats are moving plants around but also um, home aquaria and water gardens. So sometimes people have an aquarium, they decide to get real, real plants, um, and when they're done with their aquarium, they want to free their fish, which is a bad idea. That's, that's your first bad idea. Um, but then the plants go with them, and so some people do just dump their aquariums out into the nearest body of water. Um, and a lot of plants that are sold for home aquaria are good at growing in low light conditions with limited nutrients, and those are the exact same things that make them excellent invaders. Um, and water gardens, a lot of these plants are beautiful. They're absolutely gorgeous, and they were brought here as part of the water garden trade. Um, and so you get them, and you say, oh, look at this beautiful plant, and then it spreads to, you know, the wetland next to you, and then the, the lake down the road, um, and becomes a major problem. Other vectors, so anglers on their tackle and fishing gear, and obviously their boats, um, duck hunters on their decoys, on their gear, uh, if they use boats. Um, float planes, you would not think that these plants could hang on to uh, at the speeds that the float planes are going, but they can and they do. Um, we have lakes where this is the only exp explanation for how invasive plants got into them. <laughs> um, 
there, there's a chain of lakes up in Canada where that's all anyone can figure. <laughs> and divers, so on their gear and uh, tanks and such. Basically, anything that goes into one body of water, comes out and goes into another, can be a vector for an invasive plant or another invasive species. So what's currently being done? Well, Maine, and to some extent New Hampshire, has a special advantage in that currently less than 1% of our lakes are known to have invasive aquatic uh, plant infestations. In 1999, Maine started to adopt a series of laws aimed at preventing the spread of invasive aquatic plants. And we have those laws um, and you said that so that you can go look at them if you go to our lakestewardsofmaine.org website. Um, state and local efforts to control invasive aquatic plants started really picking up when we discovered um, how bad things were. Uh, however, there are challenges to control. This is a picture that was taken um, at a, uh, this is a hydrilla infestation. Um, this is Denise. Denise works for the DEP. She's currently, a, um, in this picture, she's diving uh, the hydrilla infestation. And I do want to say uh, this was not staged at all. She just came up out of the water and was covered in hydrilla. Uh, so the first problem with control is that it's costly and difficult. It's very hard, um, obviously. <laughs> hard on the body, hard on the wallet. Um, it's often destructive to those very same ecosystems that you are trying to protect. Um, it's a short-term solution to a long-term problem and we don't know what the long-term effects are. We haven't been doing it long enough to know. And of course, unless you can manage eradication, control often has to happen indefinitely. So in Maine, uh, we have three commonly used control methods. Uh, they all fall under the um, idea of manual removal, really. So manual removal is where you send a diver down with a dive bag uh, to collect a plant, put it in the bag, pull the roots up, bring it back to the surface, go back down and grab another plant. Uh, it's very, very difficult, time consuming. Um, if you've got a small infestation, maybe that would work. Uh, benthic barriers are like putting weed fabric down on your garden. They block the sunlight and they starve the plant. Uh, they have to stay down for a good stretch of time because a lot of these plants have methods of dealing with being without sunlight for extensive periods of time. Um, and these benthic barriers really only work on monocultures, so just the invasive plant. If you have a lot of natives in there too, this will catch them as well and then you'll just knock out everything. Um, diver assisted suction harvesting is basically manual removal but with an expedited way of getting that plant from the floor of the lake to the boat. Um, so it's got a suction hose, the diver's down there, doesn't have to keep on changing buoyancy um, and just feeds those plants very carefully into the hose, make sure they get to all the root ball um, and then that gets sucked up and into the boat. Um, so it's an expedited way of doing that manual removal, but still you have to have your divers, they're down there, they're pulling plants very carefully. Um, chemical control in the state of Maine is seen as a method of last resort. Uh, it's only used in extraordinary circumstances. Uh, so it has been used in Maine and um, usually only on the worst of the worst infestations. Um, New Hampshire, I believe, has a, a different um, approach, but you know, it's um, chemical, chemical control is seen in Maine as, as a last resort um, method. Oh, I do want to say that there is, if this is something that you're interested in, there is invasive aquatic plant control methods training. So if you're on a lake that has an infestation, um, we work with both the DEP and the Lakes Environmental, um, Lakes Environmental Association to train divers in proper removal techniques. We do have good news though. We've got great news really. Three lakes in our state have been removed from the list of infested water bodies. And it was because of fast, a fast find and dedicated volunteers. So you can see those lakes here. Great East Lake actually right here had, a, um, had an infestation. They found the very first plant. 
and, <laughs> and if you can find the very first plant, you're sitting pretty because you just remove that plant, keep an eye on that area, and uh, to my knowledge, Grady Slake has not had another has not had another uh, infestation, so that is great. Middle Rain Pond, they had a long slog to get rid of that infestation, but they eventually did it. And Salmon Lake was again another of those instances where they found it early, they took care of it quick. Um, there are several more lakes that are working on getting the, these plants out, and they're close, they're very, very close. Um, all of these lakes, uh, active uh, participation by volunteers, um, in almost every single case, um, it's the early detection and the dedication by volunteers which have been the key to the success of the eradication efforts. Um, and this is, I, I want to point out, these are, I believe Pixie and Lou are our oldest, um, our, our very oldest volunteers. They are both 95 right now. Um, and they have been doing this for over 10 years. Um, and uh, Pixie is actually working on an herbarium at our, at our um, offices uh, as we speak. You can't, you can't, you just can't slow her down. Um, but they were instrumental in getting the Lily uh, Brook and the Pleasant, Pond, uh, Pleasant Lake infestations under control. Uh, so let's talk about what you can do uh, if you are so interested. Um, so public involvement cannot be overstated. It really, you couldn't, there's no way you could find enough money to pay enough people to do this work. Um, it's just we have too many lakes and not enough money. So um, the first thing that anyone can do and that everyone should do is prevention. A pound, uh, I mean an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure if you can keep these uh, plants and animals from, and algae from getting into your lake, then you can stop a major catastrophe. So some of the things that you can do before you leave a boat launch, uh, you want to inspect your boat and trailer, all your equipment, remove plants, uh, animals, clumps of algae, any foreign debris, anything you can see that shouldn't be on there, just take it on off. Uh, and then secondly, you want to drain anywhere that might be holding water. Anywhere, live wells, bilge, the transom, Anywhere where there's water, you could have one of those invisible, baby uh, invasive organic, uh, I'm sorry, invasive organisms, um, and we don't want to transfer those. Um, and then, no matter how bad you feel for the fish in your bait bucket, or the worms, or anything, um, please empty your bait bucket on land, feed the seagulls. <laughs> Uh, don't release live bait into a water body ever or transfer aquatic animals between water bodies. And then after you, after you leave the launch, uh, you can wash your boat, your tackle, your trailer, all your other equipment uh, to kill invasive species that you can't see. Uh, we recommend using hot tap water and dish soap or a high pressure sprayer with soap and then you want to dry your equipment for at least five days and not five soggy wet foggy days but five nice bright sunny days um, because these organisms can survive that long out of the water and then you want to learn what they look like um, and know which waterways are infested and if you ever have a question and you think you've got an invasive species, you can go to your local organizations, the AWWA, um, you can send it to us at Lake Stewards of Maine, you can send it to the DEP, uh, we will all be happy to help you determine what that plant or animal is. And of course, if you do find something invasive, report it to us, uh, the DEP, or Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. We're really, really pushing clean, drain, dry. That's all you gotta know. Clean, drain, dry. Clean your boat, drain your wells, dry everything off, um, and you will not be part of the problem, you'll be part of the solution. Um, some other things that you can do is if you know you're on a lake that's infested, stay away from those areas that are known to be infested. Just don't go there and uh, hopefully you won't pick up anything that is, uh, that is dangerous, but of course, still check your boat when you get out. Um, you want to post warning signs at public boat launch sites. This one's really nice. It has both a plant disposal container and a brochure holder um, so that you can get rid of your plants and get educated at the same time. 
Um, and then you can go out and help inform your community. Anyone who might have an interest in your lake or using your lake, um, you can talk to them or distribute materials to them. Um, they're, they're in this too, whether or not they know it. Um, and you can join the statewide volunteer effort, which we have a lot of fun, so I highly recommend it. Uh, the first line of defense is courtesy boat inspectors. So these are people who are at boat launches. They are checking the boats as they go in and come out and taking, they're helping um, boaters do those, those prevention uh, techniques that I told you about earlier. And they really are saving main lakes. Um, I love this story. This is Dave Potter. Um, he was doing a, a CBI for a bass tournament on Unity Pond. And, you know, they want to get in there fast because position is everything with a bass tournament. Um, but Dave is very thorough, fast and thorough. And he reached underneath the carpeted bunk of this boat trailer and he pulled this seed off. This is a, um, a water chestnut seed. And water chestnut's one of those invasive plants that's not yet in the state, and one of the reasons why it's not yet in the state is because of Dave right here. Um, CBI growth continues. Uh, there's more CBIs uh, inspected every year. Um, this information only goes up to uh, 2016. Uh, the new information should be coming out at the uh, Milfoil Summit, which is happening not this Friday, but next Friday. Yep, on the 26th. Um, and so these are the confirmed saves in 2016. There were over 5,000 plants removed from boats and trailers in 2016. Um, not all of those were invasive. Only 124 were found to be invasive, but still, that's a lot of invasive plants. Um, so self-inspection is very important. <laughs> If you find the plant, um, because not every, not every boat launch in the state of Maine or the state of New Hampshire is going to have a courtesy boat inspecting on it at all times. Um, so if you inspect your own boat, uh, then you don't have to worry if someone's there or not. You're taking care of it all the time. Uh, the second line of defense is early detection. If a plant makes it through that, um, that prevention net, then we want to find it as soon as we can. And so when you're out on the water, be on alert for suspicious plants. Uh, the more that you get to know the plants in your water body, the more you'll be able to figure out if something that you have is suspicious. And we are happy to help you learn uh, those plants if that's something that you're interested in. And because alert and informed citizens really have been the early detectors in almost every single case. Um, so we have uh, trained over 4,700 uh, plant patrollers to date, uh, which we're very happy about. Some of them are certified, some of them aren't, but you don't have to be certified to know what an invasive plant looks like. Um, so this is Dick Butterfield, and he's a great guy. He, got, uh, he went to one of our workshops, he got trained, he um, went out and started paddling around. He went into this little cove that was nearby where he lives and he looked down and he saw some pretty floating leaf plants, some, some nice uh, foliage. It's very, very beautiful. Um, but he'd been trained, he knew what he was looking for. He looked below the surface and he found the hydrilla infestation on Damariscotta Lake. It, at the time, was only in this cove. There were a few plants that had made it out of the cove, but just a few. Um, he sent it to us. We knew exactly what we had. Um, called in the DEP, and they, um, so that triggered a rapid response. So the Department of Environmental Protection went in there. They completely isolated the lagoon. They just cut it off from the rest of the lake. Uh, they pulled as much of the plant as they could. They pulled those plants that had made it out beyond the barrier. Um, they put down benthic barriers and they hit it with a targeted herbicide. Hydrilla really is the worst of the worst and it does warrant the uh, harshest and fastest um, reprisal. And they've been monitoring it and, and treating it for um, I believe it's been over 10 years now. I think they found this in 2008 or 2009. So the first lesson is that plants aren't always where you think they should be, 
Normally, since we are the primary movers of these plants, we'd expect to find them closer to a boat launch, but that was not the case uh, here. Um, and then lesson two is that early detection really does save lakes. They found it, they've been treating it. It's not, the, and they, um, Damascata Lake does a survey every year. They survey the, sh the, the littoral zone where plants can grow, and they have not found any more uh, of this plant except for a, a patch in Davis Stream, which they're also treating. Um, so we're definitely making a difference. We, uh, all of us together making a big difference, but there's a road ahead uh, because the challenge is that there are <laughs> 33,000 lakes and ponds in the state of Maine. We recognize um, that, uh, so about 6,000 are over 10 acres in size, but we have a lot of ponds in Maine. And we've got thousands of miles of stream habitat. So that's a lot of area that could potentially be infested. Um, so the solution we've come up with is volunteer leadership. People on the ground in the area um, taking control of, uh, of their organization and, uh, and surveying. Um, and so we support leadership at all the levels at Lakes Stewards of Maine. And if this is something that you're interested in, um, you can talk to us about getting trained and joining up. Um, but regardless of what you do, if you want to be a gung-ho uh, team leader or regional leader, or if you just want to learn a little bit more about plants and keep an eye out while you're out on the water, we're here to support you. Um, if you want to form a team, we're here to help. Um, if you are looking to join a team that already exists on your lake, we can put you in touch with the current leader. Um, teams are very important. They're good uh, because you have more eyes on the water. The more eyes, the better. Um, and there's better quality assurance. You're covering all those areas that you need to cover. Um, there's long-term sustainability. We have a lot of lakes where we have one monitor. Just one person doing all the work. And if they decide to move, or they decide one day that they're just done, um, then there's no one watching that lake. So we really do support teams as a way of sustaining the effort. Um, because even if you do a survey today and there's no invasive plants, you could come back tomorrow and someone's been and gone and dropped something in your lake. So, um, and of course, it's a lot more fun. Uh, we have a lot of teams that have these get-togethers, they have beginning of the season barbecues, end of season barbecues. Um, it's a great way to meet your neighbors and make friends. Um, so if these are things that you're interested in, we have uh, how to lead a plant paddle, which gets people involved in the, at the most basic level, just kind of get your feet wet. Um, if that's something that you're interested in, we're doing a training on how to lead a plant paddle at the main milfoil summit coming up. Uh, we also have a view scope clinic. View scopes help you see into the water when conditions are not ideal. Um, for really, really just gung-ho people, we have aquatic plant identification proficiency certification uh, where we teach you not just how to identify those na uh, invasive plants but also a lot of natives. Um, we have support for leaders and everyone else on our um, Lake Stewards of Maine website. Uh, specifically for leaders, we have an IPP leaders page. Um, and I want to thank everyone for joining us today. That kind of covers all the basics and I am here for questions. Also, uh, if you would like to, I have some plastic plants that we have, they're aquarium plants, and I can teach you how to use um, what may be the best simple, single guide that anyone could have, um, the Quick Key. The Quick Key has all 11 invasive aquatic plants um, and how to determine whether or not the plant that you found is a suspicious plant and might be invasive or something that you don't need to worry about. So after this, uh, if you want to come with me, we can all grab quick keys and I can show you how to do a rundown of a plant on the quick key um, so that we can uh, all take a look and, and see how it works. Uh, at the end of this, uh, we always like to say, uh, do you know what's growing in your favorite water body? And this is our little lake monster.
I change her name every year. I think this year she'll be a Hilda. I like that. Um, and, uh, and so if you don't, and you want to, you can come to one of our workshops. Uh, and, or if you don't and you want to, but you're not that, uh, not that sure yet, you can just grab a quick key and take that with you and this is all you need to be a Cracker Jack um, detector out on your lake. So uh, that's it for this. If everyone would like to come with me over to the plants, we can just head on over there and run through a quick key. I'll grab some and we'll go take a look. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I do want to say, if anyone has any questions, please just throw them at yes. I'm the director of the library in, just over the line in New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. Wondering if you're targeting libraries with this identification with the quick key? Oh, um, I don't believe so at this be, point in time. It would be good to have. We have, we have seven lakes and ponds just in Wakefield, so. Yeah. You have some she could take with her today. I do, yes, yeah. Yeah. But, um. Can we just remove them too? We do too, yeah. We take them with us. Yeah. I just think that would be really something valuable for people who are. You have to bring a new counter. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful, it's, um. It's waterproof and tear resistant. We used to say it was tear proof and then we brought it to a, four, uh, a, a fourth grade class and they're not tear proof. <laughs> um, but yeah, that would be, I would love to talk to you more about that. Let's, yeah. Um, so any, anyone else have any other questions? Or do you just want to get to the plants? Plants, let's go. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, you're welcome.